morning. Just checking that mic there. That's coming through good, David. Thank you very much. Good to have you here with us and welcome us. So in our gospel lesson this morning, as we came to the end of it there, we see Jesus calling his first disciples. And that begs the question, why? What's the purpose? Why did he call them? What did he have in mind? What was the job he had for them? What was the assignment? And the answer for that, you know, is given in Jesus' last words to the apostles and his last words while he was here on this earth. And that's in the book of Acts, chapter 1. And... Uh, what we want to hear from Jesus is what assignment is he going to give to the disciples. And so the assignment he gives them is this. He says, But you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. You shall be witnesses. Witnesses, there's the main purpose, that's it, to be witnesses. I'm going to see if I can make this work. I never seem to have, there we go. But you shall be witnesses. Now when I think of witnesses, you know, I tend to think of courtrooms. Whenever I think of courtrooms, unfortunately I think of lawyers. I'm sorry, I hope there's no lawyers. <laughs> I kind of said that because I'm hoping Jack is listening right now because maybe he would love that. Anyway, you know, lawyers are necessary, right? Lawyers are there to interrogate witnesses. And witnesses are there to bear witness to the truth. But some, you know, and we, we, we put lawyers on a pedestal sometimes, but they're not always the brightest light on the tree. I want to give you three indications here of uh, some original interrogations in a courtroom. Here's one of them. The lawyer asks, were you present when this picture of you was taken? <laughs> Here's another one. She had three children, right? The lawyer said, yes, said the uh, witness. How many were boys? None. Well, were there any girls? <laughs> the youngest son of the 20-year-old, how old was he? <laughs> the best one is this one. Doctor, before you performed the autopsy, did you check for a pulse? No, said the doctor. And he went on. Uh, did you check for blood pressure? No, said the doctor. Did you check for breathing? No, said the doctor. So then is it possible that the patient was alive when you began the autopsy? No, said the doctor. Well, how can you be sure, said the lawyer. The doctor said, because his brain was in a jar sitting on my desk. But that's not where it finishes. The lawyer goes on and says, oh, I missed it there. But could the patient have still been alive nevertheless? And I like the uh, doctor or the, pa or the witness's answer. I suppose it's possible he could have been alive and practicing law somewhere, perhaps right here in this courtroom. <laughs> Anyways, I'm not trying to make fun of lawyers. I'm sure a lawyer could come up here and make fun of pastors. There'd be lots of bloopers. But when you think of lawyers, lawyers have a very important job. They're a necessary component of any trial. But a witness carries all the weight, right? Because without a witness, you wouldn't know what the truth is. The witness has the greatest influence in a courtroom, not the lawyer. And I don't know if any of you have ever been involved in a court procedure. I was actually in court just this last week, not for myself, but there to support a Christian brother. And sadly, his father was brutally murdered there a year and a half ago, and he and his wife were there. They didn't have any other family to be with them. And so I sat with them throughout the trial. And you know, if I was in a trial as a witness, what kind of witness would I be? And what kind of witness would you be? You know, we can meet someone... Uh, casually somewhere here at church or maybe somewhere out in the mall or somewhere that we're, we're mixing with people, five minutes later, I bet often we wouldn't be able to pick them out of a, a line, a lineup. 
And sometimes we don't pay enough attention, especially to the people around us, and sometimes our witness is not all that great. And with all the long delays that we have in our court system today, and the natural way that people's memory just seems to dwindle with time, it's actually amazing to me just how much the legal system depends heavily on the testimony of witnesses. You wonder how it could ever have a chance of succeeding. And what's even more amazing to me is that Jesus, Jesus took and entrusted his reconciling work. He took and entrusted his reconciling work to witnesses, to the disciples, and then to those who follow after. Everything that he had done Everything that he had died for, he entrusted to witnesses. Remember the verse that says, Do not leave Jerusalem. Wait for the gift of my father promised, which has been speak with which he has spoken about. For John baptized with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now those weren't his last words. Those were words prior to the day of his ascension. But notice the Holy Spirit has the power. The Holy Spirit is what gives us the ability to witness. It's what encourages us to be a witness. It all depends on the Holy Spirit. And Jesus, as I said, before he died, he entrusted his reconciling work to the disciples and to those who follow like you and me. So what is Jesus' plan for reconciling the world today? It's us. That's a heavy, heavy load to carry. We are entrusted with the work of Jesus and to be witnesses to him. And that's meant to be something that just blows us away and to which we rely upon the Holy Spirit because without him we can do nothing. You and me. So the question is, how's that going for you? How's your witnessing going for you. There's an author by the name of Pastor Greeley, and he tells a story, a true story, about a man who was running for an election. And he was a very competent person. He was a clever campaigner, but he wasn't known well amongst the people. He had a great platform, but in order for him to get out there, he had to attend many different functions, and he had to be here and there at different parties and different church meetings and different gatherings and so on, and he needed someone to organize all of that. And so he hired a, uh, a friend of his as his advance man, and what that means is someone who organizes, plans all these events, makes sure that he has enough time to get from one to the other. And this advance man was there supposed to be organizing everything. But this fellow didn't have a lot of great gifts for connecting with people. And he seemed to be more pompous, and worst of all, he was disorganized. And the other people working on the campaign really didn't like this guy, but the, the, uh, the politician kept him anyway because he was his friend. And as it came close to the end of the election, the polls were showing that they weren't doing all that well. And so this advance man, instead of sticking with it, he just up and quit. And then the vote was taken, and you know what? He missed out by only a half of a percentage. And the media pointed out that if this fellow that he had hired to organize his election had stuck with it and done a better job, they would have won in a landslide. And after telling this story, Pastor Greeley, he says this, and I think they're very provocative words. He said, I'm going to tell you because I can't see him. Can you advance it for me there, please? He says, we're supposed to be, you and I are supposed to be advanced persons for Jesus. Sometimes you wonder why he doesn't fire us. You and I, we are supposed to be advanced persons for Jesus. We're supposed to be witnesses, making sure that that message gets communicated. Because, you know, the world today is so desperate for truth. And the world today has just gone so far off the rails. It's drifted so far from the shore 
You know, with its gender theory and its woke thinking and the save the planet religion and the anti-Christian morality and the anti-common sense movement, more than ever, our world is in desperate shape. And it needs the witness, your and my witness. It needs us more than ever. A good witness today is supposed to be someone who is, it's not working for me, could you advance to the next one please? Someone who is credible. A good witness has to be someone who's credible. And there's few people I think that we dislike more the people that are not genuine and they're hypocritical and they say one thing while doing another, right? Credibility is everything in today's society. And we're tired, I think, of people who, who do that, they, 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 especially, sadly, politicians who do that, who, who will do virtue signaling. Have you ever heard of that term? Virtue signaling means you put it out there to make it look as though you're doing the right and the good thing. But in the background, you're doing something completely different. Or your motives are not at all what are being portrayed. You do something to gain support instead of doing the right thing. That's what virtue signaling is. And Jesus says to beware that you're not deceived. He says in two different places, he's therefore, you must be as serpents and harmless as doves. You must be wise, but you must be harmless as doves. And then he goes on to say, do not be deceived. Be on your guard, because there's a lot of virtue signaling out there. There's a lot of people who say one thing and do another. And it's not just politicians. (laughs) I bet you you and I sometimes may even be guilty of that same thing. But we're not to be deceived. We need to be watching for that. So a good witness has to be credible. Let's go on down to a few more slides, Moses. Next one then. And we talked about that. Yep. And one more. Oh, one more. Thanks very much. Not only does a good witness have to be credible, a good witness has to be caring. I know of a young man who sadly got into alcohol and got into drugs and he went into a treatment center, but he just wasn't getting into the spirit of the treatment. And he was struggling and he was also, he he had trouble with alcohol and he didn't like the 12-step program of AA because he didn't believe in God. He didn't believe there was a higher power. He didn't believe in God and he thought it was a joke. And eventually he was counseled by someone called Murray. Now Murray was a middle-aged man and Murray was one of those battle-scarred recovering alcoholics who'd been through so much, but now as a support in this program, he was invaluable. And Murray wasn't the kind of guy to say a whole lot. But Murray had an encounter with God. And it was that encounter with God that changed his life. Somebody witnessed to Murray. And Murray didn't preach, but when you sat down with Murray, you had the sense that Murray was very close to God. And so after a while, Bob, I'll call him Bob so I keep his privacy. This young man, Bob, he was discharged from the program. But not too long after that, sadly, he fell off the wagon, so to speak, and he was back in the program again. And this time, he asked if he could have Murray again for a counselor, because this is what he said. If you could go to the next slide, please. He said, I don't know if this program can work for me or not. I don't know if there is a God, but if there is a God, I sometimes think I see it in Murray. And I thought, wow, wouldn't that be terrific if that was said of you and me? Someone who has not yet come to a full encounter with God by looking at us, by the way, what we say, what we do, the way we live, and they say, that's the kind of God that I want to believe in. This person's God, the love that he has for Jesus or she has for Jesus. It would be wonderful if someone would say that for us. Because you know, Bob knew that Murray cared. We'll go to the next slide, and I like this quote. No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And you know, you can witness and you can share the word with others, but if they don't get a sense that you're committed to it, they don't get a sense that you are credible, they don't get a sense that indeed 
you know this person, this Jesus, that you care for them, they're not going to hear the words you have to say. So who do you care for? Do you care for your neighbors? Uh, do you show care for all your family, your friends? Uh, do you care for the person in the pew next to you? Do you care for the person that maybe when we go downstairs for fellowship, you know, sometimes we sit in different groups, we don't always interact. Do you care for the person across the hall? Do you care for the person that's right next to you right now? Do you care? Caring is a, a desperate part of witnessing. Let's go to this next one. I call it the three C's of witnessing. Credibility, caring, and finally the last one is committed. Are we committed to being witnesses and disciples for Christ? You know, our lives and our, are either a witness for Christ or against Christ. There's really no in between. Are we committed to being credible and caring? And here's the other thing. Are we bold? By bold, I don't mean pushy. And I don't mean out there being arrogant with people. But I mean, are we bold enough to speak the name of Jesus without, without cowering in the corner? Are we bold enough to stand up for the, for the gospel and live as if we have nothing to hide, nothing to lose, and nothing to prove? Our witness ought to be a bold, bold witness. I want to finish with, with this story Keep going for me, Moses. Yes, we'll go past that. Yeah, thank you. There we are. Remember the parable of the two sons? You know what I, you know, the father goes to his oldest son and he says, son, I want you to go into the vineyard and I want you to work for me today. And the oldest son rebels and um, I think my oldest son is listening this morning. And sometimes he was like the oldest son. And he might say, no, I don't, I've got other things to do or whatever. But, you know, he always did it. He would do what he was asked. He might perhaps say no at the begin with, but he always did what he asked. So I'm going to say thank you, Stephen. And we had another son, too. And he was well-meaning. And he always wanted to say yes. So he would say yes right off the bat. But eventually he'd forget about it, and he wouldn't do it. That wasn't because he was being rebellious. It was just his memory wasn't all that great. So he, he forgot about it and he didn't do it. So he, Jesus talks about this man who had two sons. And Jesus then asks, he says, okay, now of these two sons, which one did the will of the father? And the answer is obvious, right? The first son did the will of the father because he went and did what he was asked. And that's an important parable for us. And I'll tell you why. Because we are the ones who said to the Father, yes, Father, we will go. Have you been baptized? Were you baptized into the faith? Are you part of a fellowship? Are you part of a community, a part of a church? Have you made vows of commitment? We said we would go. The question is, have we gone? Have we gone? Are we going now? Are we doing the will of the Father? Our world is in so much turmoil, it needs the gospel. It needs your witness. And you know what? You have a testimony to share. And only you can share it. And you know what? Your testimony cannot be discounted by anyone else because it's yours. It's your personal experience with Jesus. And that testimony needs to be shared to the world. I'm not trying to make you feel guilty because sometimes we're silent witnesses, right? Friendship evangelism only goes so far. Eventually the name of Jesus needs to be spoken. And you have a testimony to share. So I really want to encourage you today to not only say, yes, Father, I will go, 
but be like the first son and go and witness to the grace of Jesus Christ in a world that is hurting and is in darkness. Behold, a light has shone, was in our lesson. Be that light. Let's pray. Father God, um, you've called us to be your witnesses. Uh, your saving work is to be our first and foremost priority in how we live and how we speak and in how we share with others. We talked with the children this morning about sharing. What's the most important thing we can share? They told us God's word. Father, make us to rely on the Holy Spirit to have that willingness to live boldly, to speak your name, to bring the gospel to the world. Because, Father, you have called us to be your witnesses. We have said we will go. Help us to go. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, as the children um, had said, the best thing we can share is God's word. And that word is a word of life. It's not a word of death. There's a lot of death in our culture. And I thank uh, a few people in our congregation who brought that to my attention, that, you know, sometimes that's where our focus is today. And you look at uh, most of the programs that are being produced in TV and so on, there's always some darkness to it, usually. And, you know, our word is a word of life. And praise God for that. So get out there and share that word. It needs to be heard. Let's sing our last song.